Rust by example, formatted print, we can print a lot of things. Rust gives you a lot of capabilities to print a lot of things in Rust, a lot of different ways, but they're all kind of the same. They're all the same. With the with these macros, they give you the same sort of control. There's really only one major difference. One of these macros will allow, the format macro will allow you to print directly to a string, basically to a buffer. What you can do is what you can store that data in a variable and then use it probably to print out later somewhere else. Uh, the other options, we've got a lot of options with printing data out from your, your uh, application here. They're all basically the same. You've got print and it's exactly the same as format. Actually, these all provide the same sort of footprint prototype, the same argument pattern that you can leverage in every single one of these macros. Print will just, it's the same as format. And then you got print line, which is the uh, same as print, but adds a new line. And you've got ePrint, which prints to the as standard error output. And then ePrint new line, which is the same as ePrint, but with a new line. So we kind of have three variations, all of which are basically the same for the most part. Really simple example of throwing uh, the print, uh, getting data from your application and printing it as an output. We've got print line to macro, which is what this ex the explanation point notates here and then we simply just print and then you can format that this is a whole the idea with formatted print um it is basically not formatted print if you do this i mean you're just printing out a string you could do that where you don't have any arguments or any variables that are interpolated in the formatted in the string itself once you've add, added variable interpolation then now we're getting a little bit closer to the formatted print because you can start doing fun things with the data that you provide it here's where the formatted print gets its formatting we're taking the data that we input it into it and for example integers we can print that data in various varieties so we can say i want to print that this number as a binary. So it'll print this number in ones and zeros. You can also print an integer in octal, which converts the number and prints it into numbers that are between zero and seven. So it's base set, base eight, or is that base seven? Cause base 10 is zero to 10. There's technically 11 digits. Although the 10 kind of is a wrap around with a one on front of it. Okay, it's gotta be base eight. So octal would be base eight, binary is base two, X is for hexadecimal, which is base 16. And you can have uppercase or lowercase if you want. You can also get fancier with your, your formatting by adding, um, so you can uh, align your numbers in, in, in uh, sort of a, a row vertically. So it looks nicer when it's printed out. And you can also do the same instead of a space, you can pad it with zeros. So you got a quick example of that here. You can do space padding or zero padding in either direction. You can also pass a variable for how much it's gonna be spaced by saying, uh, adding an extra variable interpolation here. So you can say width and the number for the, the width of the spacing. And here's my favorite part of the a recent Rust release for versions 1.58 and above. You can print formatted numbers with variable interpolation without having to add them into the macro itself. So any Anything that's within the scope can be captured directly as variables in your print. And this makes the code look a lot cleaner. And it's really easy to see and understand what's going on here. Because even if you were to say, pass in a variable value like number equals number, that's really annoying, right? Because now it's just wasted syntax. Because the first number, the, the variable, the name of the variable will be used to interpolate that data here. And then you need to assign it. So it's just much nicer. It's so much nicer to be able to do it like this. I love it. So while this simple form of printing actually works really well for simple variables and primitives, when you get into more complicated structures, you will want to have more control of how that data is printed. Debugging in Rust, typically what we want to do with this uh, Rust by example that we're going to follow, as the compiler mostly takes care of everything for us, there's still things that we need to debug in terms of like workflow and logic and things like that, because our application might not be working as we intend, even though it's working, right? Because Rust takes care of a lot of the, uh, the parts that break most frequently. Your application can work successfully incorrectly. <laughs> so you need to be able to debug further. And a lot of that goes into how you're gonna be printing, how your application is performing its workload. And so now we need to get into uh, a deeper, more involved way of printing data instead of just using a print with an explanation point at 
as a macro, we need to define how we're going to print that data. So we need to write some extra code here. Good news, Rust brings a really easy option, derive debug, which is a really nice, simple macro we can just append directly to any of our kinds of custom structures. And it, what it's gonna do for you is it'll automatically enumerate all the data types that are within your structure, whether you have a list tuple style structure or a name value pair structure. Do some of that easy heavy lifting for you so it makes it really easy to print. So this is the easiest approach. So for example, we have a structure here, which is just a tuple of one element of an uh, signed integer 32 bit. We will take that and try to print it. If we didn't have the derived debug, the compiler would just fail. It would say, nope, sorry, you can't do that. There's no way for me to know how to print it. But with it there, it will automatically, it'll print the name of the structure and any data associated with the structure. So you, you pass in your your structure, your variable, however you've defined it here. So structure with a three, so it's, um, it's a signed integer value. And then you have to use uh, your curly braces with a colon and a question mark, which will then invoke the debug printing capability. If you exclude that and you try to print, it'll just, the compiler will also complain. So you have to do two things in order to get your, your structures. Even though you've you specified derived debug, you have to invoke derived debug with a colon question mark inside of your curly braces. And then it will print, it'll print it for you. Even if you have nesting, you can do the same there and it will print multiple, multiple values Values. It basically, it'll go as, as much as you need it to. So this is like a really easy approach to getting your data to be printable and also debuggable. I use this very often. It's like an immediate go-to. It's really straightforward and simple. This is where I use it the most often. Here we go. Derive debug on a structure with some name value pairs. So a person with a name and an age, when you initialize that, oh, there's also a pretty print. Oh, right. Wait, hold on. Okay, so this is when it gets, okay. So we've derived debug on a structure. We've initialized it and then we're printing it using our colon and question mark. When we also specify the pound sign, the octothorpe, the hash tag sign, it'll print it pretty. What is not pretty like? Let's do that side by side. It just adds some spacing and formatting with newline characters. So you can print it like this without any newline characters using just colon question mark. Then if you want to add some formatting to it, you can add the the hashtag sign, the 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 number symbol, the pound sign, the octothorpe, and there we go. That's you don't usually have to go much further than this. This is going to be your mainstay. You will want to be using derived debug uh, when you need to, very most frequently, and then you can print it out. It can get more complicated, and you can go even further by creating your own custom print capabilities. Who would have thought there's so many ways to print data from your application in Rust? And we're not done yet, there's more to go. We're working on just ways to print out the data from your Rust application. Very often we need this for either logging, monitoring, as well as debugging when we're building our application in Rust. So while you most often frequently will use derived debug and then just print the data out for debugging purposes or even just general logging, you can go a step further by implementing format debug and format display. When you have your complex structures, you're able to assign these traits into your structure. So that way, when the print function is invoked, it will know what to do when it sees the curly braces or when it sees the curly braces with a colon question mark. Those two things indicate how it's going to be displaying the data. With format display, it's just gonna look for the colon or the uh, the, the, pr the curly prints. And then for format debug, it's gonna look for the curly prints or the curly braces here with the colon and question mark. So we can implement both of those traits to display our, our uh, structure differently depending on how we want to leverage it when we print the data. So here's a quick simple example of how to do that. We want to first import standard FMT and FMT is going to come along with uh, some trait definitions that we can use in order to apply displaying data from our object, from our structures, when we want to print it out. So we have a simple structure here, structure with one, uh, one integer, that's a signed 32-bit integer. And we want to be able to leverage when we when we print the the curly braces, which is just a standard display. So we'll use uh, IMPL to implement the FMT display for our structure. What we need to do with this trait is we it's, it's looking for an FMT function, and it's going to pass us a reference to FMT formatter, which is basically a buffer. I had to double check to make sure that I was right on that. It's a reference to a variable. 
uh, which has a string buffer and also is able to work with uh, a few other functions. But there's the string buffer right there. And so what we wanna do is we're gonna be able to sort of write into that buffer, the, the, the formatter using the write macro, which is the same, uh, basically the same as a print macro. So you can use all those neat formatter tricks inside of here. Uh, the write macro requires you to pass in what you're writing to, essentially, which is gonna be our, our instance of the formatter, which we're gonna mutate by appending data to it. So you can use this, this write function multiple times as you're printing into it. And then finally, when you're done with it, uh, you wanna write one last write. It could be empty, it could be, it could have just one entry here, uh, and then you wanna have no semicolon at the end representing that you're returning the result of the write macro. So just kind of looking at this here, it's not a lot of code. It's actually pretty straightforward. It's only like one, two, three, four, five, five-ish lines of code. Most of the is comments. And this allows you to create custom displays when you're writing out your variables, your structures, which is really useful because you can have it the exact kind of display that you're looking for when you're printing it out for monitoring or logging or even general usage and debugging. One last thing to note is because our structure is a tuple uh, and it's uh, basically sort of an array of un unconstrained types, you can say print self.0, which will be the first element of the tuple. So we have a quick few examples here for us. Check this out. We have a min max struct, which is a tuple with two elements. Oh, this is, is this gonna, do, this is kind of interesting. Actually, no, <laughs> I was, like, was kind of thinking that you, you can do this. It would be interesting to uh, implement a display function that would find the min and the max between two numbers, or at least say this one's bigger than the other one. Uh, you could do that with a display uh, implementation. You can get fancy with this. Though mostly you just want to print that data out. You, it's mostly for um, monitoring and logging, that kind of things. But if you wanted to, you could. Something like if self.0 bigger than self.1, you could print it. You know, this one's bigger than the other. You could do something like that. I'm just getting silly here. Okay, so this is an example of just printing a tuple. Here's another example of printing a structure with name value pairs. So X and Y, that sort of thing. Actually fairly straightforward. We just initialize some of our variables here. And then we look at the output. So our display implementation is simply going to print out the data. But if we print out the debug, it's going to include the name of the structure, the structure's name and its identity. When we're printing the display like this, to, uh, it's really straightforward print out exactly how we've defined it up here in our implementation it's just going to do x and y which is great but if you debug print it's going to include the name of the structure as well as some syntax so it's a little more verbose so you have full control here when you've defined it yourself i mean this is a, it's um um an amount of syntax don't get me wrong there's definitely several keystrokes that you need to do here Though the AI can mostly get this up and running for you. You just uh, start typing implement FMT display, and then uh, this is fairly standard. So even though it is a, a, a plate of code, um, it's fairly easy to add this into your your application. When you're writing an implementation for how you're going to display your data within your structure, Rust gives you a lot of options and it's actually fairly nimble. One of the important bits is that when you're writing into a buffer, you can keep writing into that buffer over and over and over by calling the right macro. This is really powerful. It's just sort of like a nice call out, quick and easy. When, you've def when you're writing your implementation for the trait, the FMT, we define our function FMT with our buffer formatter and return the result. You can call the right macro more than once. So you can start with some syntax here of just uh, maybe you want to add a bracket. So now we have some formatting and then uh, you want to have an in bracket at the end, but you could also iterate over a list of all the da amount, uh, data elements that you have within your structure. Maybe you're just, maybe you just want to iterate over a vector within your structure because that's the most important data that's within your structure when you want to display an output. So you can continuously, you can call the right macro on your formatter buffer. And then when you're done, just close it. And then you can create excellently formatted, actually this is valid JSON at that point that can be then imported and uh, evaluated later. It's a good serialization approach. Let's go even further. When you're printing data from your Rust application, you can do this in some very seriously complex ways if you want. Usually you don't have to. You usually just want to print the data as usual. Though you can get more complex by using traits and implementing traits in a specific way. You've seen that we can print data in like numbers in different ways. We're using different notations such and different bases. So if you wanted to print a number as binary, you can do that using formatter. If you wanted to print it as as is, right? You've got a, a straight, a simple number here. 
if you wanted to print it as hexadecimal. Oh wait, look, there, this is a thing. <laughs> Hold on a second. I was not expecting there to be a link there to be clicked on. There is apparently a little bit of a hexadecimal meme thing going on here. With hex, of course, you've got the a, a few letters, right, that are available to you when you're defining a number because it's base 16, so you go A through F, right? You can spell interesting things, and apparently there is a spelling that is, oh, it's a magic number. Okay. In computer programming, a magic number is of a specific use. So you've defined a constant that will be leveraged and looked for in your source code. If the number is present, it will go a step further to invoke special magic. And this particular hex value is uh, pre pretty famous, I guess, because it's used in several... I wonder what the history is behind it. Who uses this? Anyway, this is that number. <laughs> 3.7 billion is that number. Anyway, beside the point, getting back to the, the original, we want to be able to print our data so we can explore it, debug it, uh, and monitor it. You can also uh, print, uh, in addition to hex, you can do binary, you can do octo, which is uh, base eight, so zero through seven. Did you know that you can define a trait that will look for these things and then print in a specific pattern. And I was looking to find a list of all available options. And so in addition to display, which is the one that we use the most, right? So just print this data out. You also have octal, right? You have hex, uppercase hex, lowercase hex, the debug, right? So you have all these formatting indicators. You can write traits spe specifically for those so that way when you're printing, you can print out a pattern and you override these capabilities. So if we wanted to override octal, we would just uh, capture octal there. And instead of display, we say octal. <laughs> like that. And then we would have to say colon O for octal. I think that'll work. I'm so curious to see. Let's find out. Yes, it worked. <laughs> So you can override any of those neat patterns just by changing uh, what you're implementing. The, tra the trait function is the same either way. In addition, they do bring in uh, what you can do. It write, the write macro is exactly the same as the format macro. And you can also format using various notations. So in this case, you can see here we have a colon uh, and a, a dot three. So what that's going to say is you want to format this value that's going to be interpolated here as a floating point number with three decimal points. So it's really powerful and neat that you can do that here using the right macro as well. So when we're printing, say, like a coordinate, like a lat long, any data associated with a city, you can print it in a way that is nicely formatted. So it's clean and easy to read for a human. So they have an activity at the end here so for us to try so that we can see if we understand how we can leverage the printing cap capabilities. They want us to uh, so we've got a color here that's being printed out in the debug. They want us to implement display format for the color struct that will print out not only the red, green, blue decimal values with base 10, they want us to do a hexadecimal print as well. And this will be the last thing uh, we do here in the video in terms of taking a look at printing output data with Rust. So let's give it a shot. Let's implement. Let's do it. We're going to implement display for color. And then for uh, clarity, I'm just going to put bring in scope uh, the unsigned 8-bit character uh, integer here. So we'll have red, green, and blue. Right. For simplicity, what I want to do is uh, set my... I want to interpolate some variables here using the destructuring approach. So I can decompose these struct values into some local variables that will be easily act. So that way I don't have to pass in each each uh, each letter or each variable here in the right macro. So this makes it easier to read. So this will give me my red, green, blue integer values. So I click play and I should be able to see, okay, uh, red, green, blue. So it's not all the way there yet. Let's finish this up. Uh, let's see here. So let's make it look pretty the way they wanted it to look here. And then we need to do the hex, the hexadecimal aspect. So RGB. So it should be 80 ff 5a it should and it's all capital letters so x and then we want green and blue that's it it should work i think that's it we click the play button is it gonna work we did it well oh wait we mostly did it <laughs> they have some sort of zero padding here to make it look pretty so i guess we have to add the padding in there too ah oh, oh, that's extra effort but i got this one right they knew that was going to happen didn't they and we have to do the zero padding for each of these elements all right i was able to figure it out we just needed to add a couple extra uh, characters to add zero padding for our hexadecimal so all we do is add zero two in these hex sections and then we should get our exact values that we're looking for to complete the activity see if it finishes is this.
And it works. It, we, uh, did it? it yeah, that's it. We, we, we did it. We win. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, oh, the, wait, is this the answer? You can also, pa oh, they had the answer right there the whole time. I had to like fiddle around with it. Should have just read. This is a good reason to read the documentation. <laughs> they also gave you a hint where you can multiply numbers together. So that way you get the full hex value with zero padding. Just in case you run into this in the future, zero padding is with a hexadecimal value or octal or binary. If you ever need it, you just place a zero, the number of decimals, and then the formatting attribute item here that you want to be the numbering to be formatted in. You can even do it with a floating point number if you wanted. 